This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week Leica announced that they're ditching Huawei and instead turning to Xiaomi. Microsoft announced big new updates for Windows on ARM and Broadcom announced that they're buying VMware for 61 billion US dollars. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with the world's first 500Hz monitor from Asus and Nvidia called the ROG Swift 500Hz Gaming Monitor, which has a 1080p TN panel. There's no price or availability yet, and I don't quite know if you could tell the extra frames at that point anymore, but cool. Then Corsair announced the Voyager, an all AMD gaming laptop, which is not only the first ever gaming laptop from the brand, but also comes with a touch bar of sorts that doubles as a sort of Elgato Stream Deck right on your laptop. Next up, Logitech's new mouse and keyboard offer a quieter click and a more clack respectively. The new MX Master 3S series mouse isn't massively changed to what you know and love in the series already, but it has a higher DPI sensor for higher accuracy, and both the left and right click buttons are now way quieter. Here's a sound comparison from my studio mate Killian. Weirdly satisfying for $99. Otherwise, Logitech's MX Mechanical and MX Mechanical Mini are a new pair of keyboards with mechanical switches aimed to make them feel more tactile. And again, they're aimed at workers, not really gamers. They are wireless, they have USB-C charging, and they last up to 10 months if you don't use the keyboard backlighting. And finally, Harley Davidson also released the Serial One Bash MTN, which is a $4,000 electric mountain bike, weirdly without suspension or shock absorption. Obviously not all bikes need suspension, but the company literally said it's for quote, the most direct connection between you and the trail. <laughs> okay. Okay, and my first story of the week is going to be Xiaomi announcing their new brand partnership with Leica, who used to be brand partners with Huawei. It all feels a lot like this meme, but just uh, corporate, I guess. And it's obviously not a great sign for Huawei's mobile ambitions. And I'm generally pretty negative about these brand partnerships, but let's take a look at what we have here. So Leica previously worked with Huawei since 2016 across smartphone cameras. And since then, Huawei has built a pretty solid camera reputation, although it was always unclear how much Leica actually had to do with that, apart from lending their name and some image styles to the company. Of course, then OnePlus, and Oppo teamed up with Hasselblad after years of having some of the least impressive camera systems and flagships, and there the collaboration became even less concrete in a way. The main difference that I see with Xiaomi and Leica is that they are now specifically claiming that the coming device has a quote, unprecedented deep cooperation process, and quote, both parties have successfully worked on a goal of providing customers a new era of mobile photography. That's a pretty significant promise, though I of course kind of expect to be disappointed. We already got our first apparent leak, by the way, featuring Leica branding, which came in the form of the Xiaomi 12S, which seems okay, I guess. But the announcement video that the company split out in China, which I've linked to down in the description, is really hilariously low effort, in my opinion. Just people sitting in suits, visibly bored, visibly reading vague corporate statements in bland rooms over video calls and whatever, which really doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of love between the two brands here. And of course, Xiaomi's track record with cameras is also kind of mixed so far, so unless they do something surprisingly great, I feel like this could end up devaluing the Leica brand quite a bit. Going to Huawei first and then selling out to Xiaomi right away really feels like you're just willing to slap your logo on anybody's products who's willing to pay, which is not a great sign, but we'll see how this ends up being. Okay, and my second story of the week is going to be the three big announcements coming out of Microsoft's Build Conference this week. First, Windows 11 will be opening up its pretty underwhelming widget system to third-party developers going forward in the hope that someone somewhere makes something good that finally makes using widgets on Windows 11 useful for a change. Second, Microsoft is taking on website builders like Wix or Squarespace with its own low-code website builder called Power Pages. The selling point here, as usual, is that this is part of Microsoft's Power Platform. So if your company uses that already, you can pull in data from Power BI or virtual agents, etc., into making websites basically without coding. 
And third and most importantly, there is news about Windows on ARM starting with a new Qualcomm-powered developer mini-PC by Microsoft called Project Volterra to allow developers to build cloud-native AI apps, whatever that might be. Qualcomm had earlier released what sounds like a similar developer PC with a 7C Gen 2, but we don't actually know what specs the new Microsoft machine will be coming out with, apart from the fact that it's probably stackable. Of course, this is not really a PC for us, but rather developers who can use it to build ARM apps and to test ARM apps, etc. Maybe even more important for developers though, Microsoft also unveiled that basically its entire developer toolchain is now ARM native, including Visual Studio 2022, VS Code, the terminal, their Linux and Android subsystems, plus of course a bunch of open source stuff like Python and Git as well. All of which is to say that if you are a developer on Windows on ARM, you will theoretically no longer be feeling like a second class citizen. And by the way, you can use an ARM machine to efficiently build both ARM and non-ARM apps as well. Which is good news, of course, but Windows on ARM is like five years old at this point, so this really feels like something that should have happened maybe right at the beginning. Anyway, the Qualcomm Nuvia chip thing should come out in 2023, which should maybe finally challenge Apple's M1 and M2 processors on Windows. And while I would be cautious about being excited about those, at least we should have the developer side of things fixed by then. Okay, and my third story of the week is going to be some spicy corporate acquisition news in the form of Broadcom announcing that they will pay $61 billion to buy VMware. Now, if you have kind of big number blindness like most of us, that's one of the five biggest acquisitions in tech history ever. So it's a huge deal, but most of you probably don't know a whole lot about either of these companies. So here's the short of the story. Broadcom and VMware are both absolutely gigantic and kind of boring enterprise companies where Broadcom is one of the world's biggest chip designers, primarily in the wireless chip space. And VMware mostly makes virtual machine software, hence the name, VMware. Most of your devices probably have a Broadcom chip in them somewhere, and basically everyone who operates servers, for example, runs VMware software to virtualize something, so they're absolutely huge. Is that boring? Yes, absolutely. But why would a chip giant want to buy VMware? Basically, I came up with no better explanation other than that their infamous CEO just really likes to buy up gigantic companies and cobble them all up together. As you might remember, Broadcom attempted a hostile takeover of Qualcomm a few years ago, but failed after President Trump and his government basically said that they essentially weren't American enough and didn't want Qualcomm's critical tech to get into the wrong hands. And since then, Broadcom has instead bought CA Technologies, another huge and boring enterprise software company for $19 billion, and also part of Symantec, Simon Tech, I don't know how that's pronounced, the security company focused on enterprise customers as well. With VMware, I guess they want to buy a third huge enterprise software giant so they can all somehow bundle them up into one thing and fire half of the employees and save money or whatever. And by the way, just to make things even more ridiculous, Broadcom itself was earlier bought by another company called Avago. And after the purchase, Avago then got renamed to Broadcom again. And uh, if at this point you're a little bit confused about who's owning who and who's doing what, I think that's exactly the point here. Fun fact, Intel's new CEO, Pat Gausinger, used to be the CEO of VMware before he switched and before he got rid of his fake VMware tattoo. And he apparently was startled by the Broadcom purchase and hinted at him thinking that this is probably a bad idea. Great. I can really emphasize with Pat feeling like he's built something and then somebody else coming and taking over control and ruining it. And controlling our own destiny is a big reason why I and a bunch of other great educational creators got together and built our own video streaming service called Nebula that's currently on a massive discount for a few more days where it costs less than 12 bucks for an entire year. That's less than $1 for a month for both Nebula and CuriosityStream. And now is a great time to get a subscription if you have been holding off. On Nebula, you get access to bonus segments and early access for almost every Tech Altar video, as well as whole Nebula original series like Polymatter's brand new series, China Actually, my Nebula original series called Technorama about sci-fi movies, and a lot more. There is a ton of great content for you to watch there, and subscribing is a great way for you to support our business in a sustainable way. Better yet, once you subscribe, you naturally also get access to CuriosityStream itself, which is the premier place on the internet to watch documentaries. I have 
have recently been watching the new season of Engineering the Future on Curiosity Stream, looking at Perpetual Power and the Space Race, which is streaming now, and for less than a buck a month, it is fantastic value. There's history content, science content, nature content, all of it. Check it out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next Friday.